Hi, my name is Adrian. I'm an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The APRP is a Pan-African political party based in the African continent with chapters throughout the African world. I am based out of New Mexico. We also have chapters throughout North America, um, throughout Europe, and throughout the continent, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the goal of our organization is the unification and liberation of Africa under a scientific socialist government. We believe that once Africa is liberated from imperialism and from colonialism, and once the resources of Africa are controlled by the masses of African people, um, that is what it will take to liberate African people where we exist throughout the world. I want to talk a little bit today about Malcolm X and specifically about his turn towards Pan-Africanism in the later years of his life, and also about his commitment to internationalism in the African liberation struggle, and also his framing of that struggle as an anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggle in the Western Hemisphere. Um, one of the most, the lessons from Malcolm that I hold dearest to my heart is this idea that our struggle for liberation is not about being equal to colonizers, it's not about being equal to settlers within a settler colonial state, um, and it's not about seeking equality under capitalism and under colonialism and imperialism. Um, equality or oppressor is not something to aspire to. Uh, he, he was very, very strong in this point, and he reinforced it repeatedly through the rest of the speeches. Um, our goal is not to get a corner and scraps of our own within an evil system. Our goal is to overthrow that system, a system that has our dehumanization as its foundation and replace it with one that is just, um, not just for African people, but for all of humanity. We're not seeking equality to an oppressor. We are seeking liberation, and those are distinct things. And he really drove that idea home um, in speeches like uh, the Hess Negro and the Field Negro, um, where he's very, very stridently calling out the African bourgeois and petty bourgeois, calling them out for wanting a, a seat at the table, so to speak, um, calling them out for acting as sort of like a buffer between the colonizer imperialist ruling class and the masses of oppressed colonized people. They act as like a as a kind of go between, doing the will of the of the ruling class. Um, and, and, and occupying a space in society and, and having access to privilege and wealth that is a direct result of the exploitation of their own people. So he calls them out, um, referring to, to this, the bourgeois and the petty bourgeois as the house negroes. Um, and, and he basically issues a call for like the masses of African people to identify these class contradictions and to force the people to pick a side, to say like, either you are with the colonizer, either you are with the imperialist powers are you are with the masses of oppressed and colonized people. You have to pick a side. And so I think that like is something that we forget when we attribute to him like some kind of like half developed cultural nationalism. Like we Malcolm does not get enough credit for having a very, very strong analysis of the internal class contradictions of the African community and, and of, of the of the global scale contradictions between the imperialist colonizing nations and the colonizations. Um, he also had like a way of framing the struggle of Africans in the U.S. and Africans in the Western Hemisphere as an anti-colonial struggle, particularly for Africans in the United States. Um, he reinforced repeatedly that although we were made citizens of this country against their will, without our consent, um, we have never enjoyed the true um, trappings of citizenship, like to ride a bus, um, to vote, um, to, to, to work to, to go sit at a lunch counter um, like anybody else, people had to like fight and die and bleed. And so what he's saying is that all of these rights that are enshrined in this constitution, like all this flowery language, we have never had access to that. Although we are called African Americans, we have never had the full rights of citizenship here. We've never been considered Americans. We've never even been considered like fully human. Um, he has that famous quote, um, we are Africans, we happen to be in America, we're not Americans. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. So he's framing the African liberation struggle there as like in opposition um, to American identity, to American nationalism, and to the existence of the, Ameri of the U.S. in total. And that's something that's very, very um, important to highlight is that Especially in this time where we have like a lot of movements that are like appealing to the existing power structure for 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 mercy towards African people, he's saying no. Like, there's nothing the system can do for us. The system was built to oppress us. Our liberation exists outside of it, and that's what he's doing by calling us African. So that's like, yeah, I feel like people don't um, don't talk about that part of his analysis. It's like really, really key for understanding um, how we wage the struggle and what tactics are going to be most effective. The other thing. Um, is that he had always had, even when he was in the Nation of Islam, like a very strong internationalist and anti-imperialist analysis. Um, one of his most famous quotes after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, um, he said, the chickens are coming home to roost. And this is at a time when like a lot of other civil rights 
um, leaders, even the Nation of Islam, were issuing like statements of condolences. We're we're, we're sort of forgetting um, that this was the figurehead of a genocidal settler colony that enslaved our people, um, and saying like this is the sad thing that Kenny died. And Malcolm X was like, nope, we're not faking it. We're not doing that. Um, he basically he brought up the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, um, a democratically first democratically elected president of that nation, who whose execution was orchestrated by Belgium and by the CIA. He brought that up. And he was like, you cannot go to another sovereign nation. You cannot go all over the world um, <laughs> executing democratically elected leaders, um, um, overthrowing socialist governments, um, fomenting discord and strife, and basically like getting up in everybody's business and not expect that to blow back on you. Um, he called it the chickens coming home to roost because what had happened to Kennedy is what the U.S. has been going all over the world doing to everybody else. So even in like this so-called time of tragedy where people are like trying to come together, he's like, no, we're not doing that. We're, we're raising the contradiction. We're calling it out. Chicken coming on to roost. So that is like really important, like an example of like how committed he was to anti-imperialism, how strident he was um, in those politics. The other thing about his life um, that's not really discussed, but that was really influential, excuse me, influential, in which you can see in like the last years of his life, um, was the trip to Mecca, and specifically the the locations he visited on that trip. And the, and the folks he met on that trip. Like, when you hear about Mecca, you hear, like, he went to, 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 to the Hajj, he met Europeans who were Muslim, and he learned that all white people weren't that bad. And that's, like, kind of, like, the topic sentence, like, the people describe that as, like, the point of the trip, which is just to, just, to just soften his view towards working with white people. Um, but that was not the meat. That was not, like, the main... The impact, the main impact on him, the main impact was actually traveling to Africa and meeting a number of revolutionary African leaders, including Sikh Toure of Guinea, including Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, which was the first nation to liberate itself from colonialism. Um, in Malcolm X, in his biography, described the meeting with Nkrumah as the greatest honor of his life. He described Ghana as the fountainhead of Pan-Africanism. Unfortunately, we don't know specifically what went on that meeting, what was said. Um, we know from Malcolm X's biography and from Kwame Nkrumah's letters, like some of the details. Um, Kwame Nkrumah had a vision of a, he realized after Ghana gained independence that its liberation meant nothing if the rest of Africa, the entire African diaspora, was not liberated as well. Like they could not hope to maintain a decolonized state that they were completely surrounded by colonized nations. So they understood that in order for honest independence to be guaranteed, the rest of Africa and Africans everywhere had to be liberated. So to, to realize that goal, Nkrumah conceptualized a fighting pan-African revolutionary force um, to protect and advance the African revolution. And he envisioned Malcolm X playing like a leading role in that force. And that's what he raised to him during that visit. Um, he also found out through Ghanaian, Ghanaian intelligence services that the United States was planning to assassinate Malcolm, and he passed the information along as well. We don't know what Malcolm's response was, um, but we do know, obviously, that he went back to the United States and was shortly thereafter assassinated. So, clearly, um, to, Nkrumah's original vision for that plan did not come to fruition, um, but luckily Kwame Ture, formerly Swifty Carmichael, stepped in to take that role. And that, that was how the ARP came to be, but that's like a whole other story. Um, so, yeah, just like... But, so obviously Malcolm heard that warning, still decided to go back, probably the influence of having his wife and child um, in the United States um, paid a big part in his decision to go back. Um, it's very, very different when you have like a family to take care of and to, to care for when you're a target in that way. Um, but, so yeah, he went back to the United States and upon his return in 1964, he of course left the Nation of Islam and he also started this organization called the Organization of African American Unity, which was very clearly modeled after the Organization of African Unity that Kwame Nkrumah had helped found on the continent. And the vision of Malcolm X's Organization of African American Unity was to be the Western Hemisphere's wing of the OAU. He wanted to unite Afro-Americans Afro throughout the Western Hemisphere because he recognized that Afro-America Afro does not just mean the United States, it also means folks of African descent in Canada, it means African descent in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, it means people of African descent in Central and South America as well. His vision of, of this Organization of African Unity included every person of African descent throughout the Western Hemisphere. And what he wanted to do was to model after the behavior of the OAU and sort of unify people who, these people who are divided on the basis of, of, of divisions in, introduced by colonialism, um, national differences, language differences. He wanted to, to unite on the basis of being African, of being oppressed by imperialism, colonialism, and of a shared struggle together and a shared destiny. 
So that was the vision of the OAU, to put, to put all differences to the side and to come together on a hemispherical basis um, throughout the African diaspora and unite, and then unite that struggle with what was going on in the continent. So this is like a unexplicitly pan-African vision that Malcolm X is articulating, um, and you can see why this would be considered a threat to to colonial states, to settler colonial states like the United States. Um, African people uniting on the basis of being African, African people uniting on the basis of uh, resistance to imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism throughout the Western Hemisphere is a threat to every single colonial capitalist government in this hemisphere. And so for obvious reasons, the United States had to take care of that. They had to put that down. Um, the Nation of Islam is the folk, are the folks who took the fall for Malcolm's murder. But a, a saying that kind of goes around in the African world is the anyway the Nation of Islam may have fired the gun, but they didn't buy the bullets. The Nation of Islam was a pawn in a larger scheme of the United States government to neutralize Malcolm X. We know this because during his trip to, to Mecca and his trip to Africa, there were various attempts on his life, including a poisoning in Egypt, that the Nation of Islam would not have had the resources for. He was also followed by U.S. intelligence services throughout his trip in Africa. Um, he tried to land in France wasn't, and was turned away because France later said they did not want him killed in the soil. So you can see like sort of like an international conspiracy against Malcolm X being led by the United States. Um, the other thing is that the, the FBI na uh, infiltrated the Nation of Islam as far back as 1957, so for like a decade we're in there, um, sowing disconsent, um, exacerbating um, existing divisions, strategically placing informants to make sure that folks couldn't like talk to each other, um, couldn't like reconcile, and so all of these things sort of aligned for the nation of Islam to be used as a pawn in the assassination of Malcolm X. So when we talk about his historical legacy and we talk about his assassination, it is, of course, important to say that it was a nation of Islam that pulled the trigger, but we also have to implicate the United States government, um, imperialist powers in like this larger conspiracy, taking out Malcolm X because he was threatening to be a figurehead to the entire African world, not just the United States, but throughout the Western Hemisphere and soon the continent. So he was a, a serious threat to the imperialist system, and that's why they took him out. So yeah, um, yeah, that was just like a brief overview of how Malcolm X was a Pan-Africanist, why we need to recognize his internationalism and his commitment to African Union when we talk about him, and also why why those politics were a threat to the United States and why he was assassinated. So hopefully um, y'all got something from this. Thank you so much for asking me to speak. Um, I'm very, very excited and proud that this, this commemoration of a great son of Africa is happening in Brazil and that these celebrations are happening throughout the world. And yeah, thank you for allowing me to contribute. Have a great day. Forward over.